Hello and welcome to today's webinar on applying to lineage societies. My name is Ginevra Morse, the Online Education Coordinator at the New England Historic Genealogical Society. I'll be moderating today's event. NEHGS is a nonprofit organization supported by our members and donors. We provide resources and expertise in nearly all aspects of family history and are pleased to offer this webinar today for our members and friends around the world. Giving today's presentation is Lindsay Fulton, genealogist at NEHGS. Lindsay assists our library visitors with their family history research, both on-site and online. Her areas of expertise include New England and New York research and, of course, lineage society applications. Lindsay will first give a brief overview of some of the most popular lineage societies. She'll then provide a step-by-step -step process for organizing and preparing your materials for submission. And finally, Lindsay will talk about vital record alternatives and give a case study from our research services team. At any time during the presentation, please feel free to write a question in the panel to the right of your screen. Lindsay will answer as many as she can uh, during the time provided. If you don't see the question box, you can open the user panel by clicking on the icon of a white arrow with an orange background. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted to our website in the next couple of days. All right, so I will now hand things over to Lindsay. Uh, thank you, Ginevra, and welcome today uh, to everyone to this webinar. Before I go into how to apply to lineage societies, let's do a quick poll. Uh, is anyone listening today already a member of a lineage society? A survey will appear on your screen. Uh, go ahead and select yes or no, and we'll share the results in a moment. Of course, if you're already a member, some of the tips I'm going to share today will be familiar with you. Uh, but if not, I'm sure you'll learn something new. And if you're not already a member of a Lineage Society, I hope today's presentation will set you on the right path to becoming one soon. Okay, excellent. It looks like 31% uh, of you are already members and 69% of you are not. So I guess it looks like we have several prospective members today. So a, a hereditary society or a lineage society is a member-based group that is often organized around a common ancestor or group of historical importance. For example, the General Society of Mayflower Descendants is comprised of members who can trace their lineage through one or more of the passengers from the Mayflower with proven descendants. Uh, generally speaking, lineage societies often campaign to preserve the memory, memory of their particular historical figure or group and commonly participate in historic conservation and education. Members of these societies actively participate in their communities, providing members as volunteers for community projects or sponsoring academic scholarships for high school and college students, to name a few. Additionally, lineage societies often champion their own genealogical and historic research, providing researchers with specialized facility to conduct their own family research. While no lineage society is the same, each provides an environment for members to share their common ancestry and to build a sense of community and friendship with others. So I will discuss uh, some of the popular national and regional lineage societies with some short descriptions. Uh, first is the Baronial Order of the Magna Carta, which was founded in 1898 to promote and support those principles set forth in the Magna Carta. This society is for any person who can prove descent from one or more of the 25 Certes who signed the Magna Carta on 15 June 1215, or from one of the five counselors of King John. This society is by invitation only, and applications are approved by the gene genealogist of the baronial order of the Magna Carta. Now, colonial dames. Uh, this can be a little confusing because there are several societies that use the words colonial dames in their title. There are three that are the most popular. Uh, the oldest of the three was founded in 1890 to promote historic preservation and education. It's for women who descend from an ancestor who held public office or who served in the armed forces from 13 May 1607, which is the founding of Jamestown, uh, to 19 April 1775, the beginning of the American Revolution. Uh, founded one year later was the National Society of the Colonial Dames of America. This is for women who descend from an ancestor who resided in the American colonies before 1750 
and served during the colonial period. Membership for the society is uh, handled at the state level. Uh, then there's the National Society Colonial Dames 17th Century, which membership also is handled at the state society. Uh, this is for women who descend from an ancestor who resided in the American colonies before 1701 and served during the colonial period. Each of these societies are by invitation only. Now you may have noticed that I use the term served to broadly describe each qualifying ancestor. Uh, what do I mean by served? Uh, you should check each of the society websites to locate the specific qualifications as they are different for each, three, each of these three societies. The General Society of Colonial Wars was founded in 1893 for men who were 18 years or older who could prove lineal descent from an ancestor who held office or a military service from the time of the settlement of Jamestown in 1607 to the Battle of Lexington in 1775. Applications for the society are approved by the Registrar General and membership is through your constituent state society. The General Society of Mayflower Descendants was founded in 1897 to preserve the memory of the pilgrims who came over on the Mayflower and the ideals established by the Mayflower Compact. They also are uh, they also publish historic and genealogical research relating to the pilgrims. Membership in this society is for anyone who can prove lineal descent from one of the 26 passengers from the Mayflower, the male passengers who have proven descendants. Uh, and this, this society, the application is approved by the Historian General in Plymouth, and membership is through your constituent state society. Now I want to be. Uh, I would just also want to make a note here that there, the first three generations for this society, you must have proof with a, an official vital record, a birth, marriage, or death record for the first three generations. Now that's you, your parents, and your grandparent. Uh, application uh, membership with this society is by invitation only. Uh, the General Society of the Sons of the American Revolution was founded in 1889 for men who were 18 years or older who could prove lineal descent from a patriot of the American Revolution. Uh, eligibility for this society is not limited to military service. Men and women who champion the cause of American independence are also considered. Uh, for example, members of the Continental Congress, signers of oaths of allegiance, members of the Boston Tea Party, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, for this society, the applications are approved by the Registrar General and membership is through your local chapter. Uh, this is also by invitation only. The Jamestown Society was founded in 1936, and it's open to men and women who can prove descent from a specific qualifying ancestor. Now, this, uh, the, these uh, specifications are included on the Jamestown website, but I'll just read them for you quickly here. Uh, it's for any person who is a stockholder in the London Company or the Virginia Company, or a member of one of the guilds, uh, someone who owned land on Jamestown Island or who lived on the island prior to 1700, who is a resident in Virginia for the 1624-1625 muster, someone who held a specific political, specific political office prior to 1700, uh, someone who is an Anglican church minister in Virginia prior to 1700, and the other option is uh, someone who served as an Indian interpreter in Virginia prior to 1700. Membership with this society is done uh, by invitation only, and uh, individuals who qualify would get uh, life membership. So the National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution was founded in 1890 for women who are 18 years or older who can prove lineal descent from a patriot of the American Revolution. Again, eligibility is not limited to military service. Uh, your application would be approved on the national level, and then membership would be through your local chapter. And then like the uh, Mayflower Society, Daughters of the American Revolution requires birth, marriage, and death certificates for the first three generations, which again is you, your parent, and your grandparent. A membership in this society is by invitation only. And just as a side note, the uh, DAR has a fabulous library in Washington, D.C., uh, which uh, NEHGS has planned a visit uh, in 
to visit Washington, D.C., as well as the DAR Library in February. The Order of the Crown of Charlemagne in the United States was founded in 1939 for any person who can prove lineal descent from the Emperor Charlemagne. The society was uh, designed to preserve the lines of the descent from Charlemagne, to recognize acts of merit, to recognize achievements in honors in arts, scientists, and letters, and to cooperate with charitable, educational, and patriotic organizations. Uh, members for this society must be invited by two current members or approved by the admissions committee of the order. Order of the Founders and Patriots of America was founded in 1896 uh, for men who were 18 years or older who can prove descent from an ancestor who settled in the colonies before 13 May 1657, which is the 50-year anniversary of Jamestown, and whose ancestor in that same line served in the Revolution. Uh, the candidate must prove his connection through a specific male line, which I'll discuss in the next slide. Uh, applications are approved by the Registrar General, and membership is through your constituent state society. Now, the specifications for those uh, who qualify. Uh, the candidate must prove the connection through the male line of his father, which is uh, one, two, or three or through his mother's father, which is four and five. Uh, specifically, this can be accomplished through his father's maternal grandfather, which is number three, his maternal grandfather of his father's father, which is number four, or his maternal grandfather of mother's father, which is number five. The Society of the Cincinnati was founded in 1783 uh, for males who descend from commission officers who served in the Continental Army or Navy and who served to the end of the war or who resigned with honor after a minimum of three years service as a commissioned officer. This is usually done by one member per officer. However, I want to stress that it's important that you t speak directly with your state society as each of these societies have different rules. Uh, applications are approved on the state level, and members often submit their application with the state in which their ancestor resided, not their current residence. This is not typical for most societies. Okay, so before choosing membership with a particular lineage society, you must first establish your paternal and maternal lineages, which is your father and your mother, your grandparents and great-grandparents, great and so on. Since the majority of lineage societies require a direct lineal link between an applicant and a qualifying blood ancestor, establishing an ancestral chart, which is sometimes called a pedigree chart or a multi-generational chart, uh, will help you to uncover any possible qualifying ancestors. Uh, when you're doing this, you should be on the lookout for ancestors who may have served in a war, either directly or indirectly, uh, whether they held a position in government on the local or federal level, uh, whether they were credited with the settlement of a county or a town or state or colony, uh, or who may have uh, held a specific occupation, such as a tavern keeper or a constable. Often it is these ancestors who qualify for membership with lineage societies. Uh, you should also make note of any second marriages. All right, for example, here we're using a free five-generational chart, which you can download from our online learning center to look at the presidency, I'm sorry, the ancestry of President John Adams. We can identify several individuals who qualify for membership with at least five different lineage societies. First, because John Alden, who's number 22, was a passenger on the Mayflower, President John Adams and his direct descendants would qualify for membership with the General Society of Mayflower Descendants. Also, Joseph Adams, who's number four, uh, he served in King Philip's War and was a selectman for the town of Braintree in 1699, 1716, and 1717. Therefore, his direct descendants would qualify for membership with the General Society of Colonial Wars. And finally, because President John Adams, number one, signed the Declaration of Independence, 
uh, his direct descendants would qualify for membership with the Society of the Descendants of the Signers of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, female descendants would uh, qualify for membership with the Daughters of the American Revolution. And the male descendants would qualify with the Sons of the American Revolution. And this is just to name a few. Now, once you've established your lineage and identified possible qualifying ancestors, you should choose a hereditary society or a lineage society that best meets your needs. What societies does your lineage allow for membership? Why do you want to join a particular society? Do you want to be active within your community? Is a state or local chapter of the society near your home? How often do they meet? After you've identified an appropriate society, you can then begin the process of becoming a member. And remember, you can apply for membership with more than one society, and often a society will allow membership under more than one eligible ancestor, often using a supplemental application. So after you've identified an appropriate society, you can then begin the process of becoming a member. Uh, to do so, you should first contact the proper membership liaison, and you can do this either via email or phone for your state or national society. The liaison will take your personal contact information and also inform you of any documentation that may be required to complete your application. They may also require a completed worksheet or an application before proceeding further. It is absolutely paramount that you contact the society liaison as it may help you to avoid over or under researching in the future. This is an extremely important step. This may also be the time when you can establish an invitation. Remember earlier when I, was, when I said that many of the popular lineage societies require an invitation before applying? Sometimes this can be as easy as contacting the society to express in interest, as these societies consider the act of sending an application as an invitation. However, I want to warn you that some societies are very much more strict with their uh, definition of the word invitation. So uh, be careful when you're looking at, on the society's websites as to the specifications of the uh, process of inviting. Uh, the Hereditary Society Community of the United States of America maintains an up-to-date list of lineage societies complete with a short description of each society and their contact information. This is a good place to begin if you're having trouble locating contact information on the Society's website. The list is arranged alphabetically. Before you begin your membership application, you must first locate and document and then organize all of your information. I want to stress at this time that this is not where you would begin completing your membership application. This step will help you organize all of the research that you've done and that you're about to do. It will also help you to identify any miss missing documentation or a weak connection that you may have overlooked. This step may seem like extra work, but I assure you that the organization is the most important tool when applying to a lineage society. I will cover several suggestions that I've employed over the years to help you organize all of your information. These tips will help you tremendously later on, as membership applications require very specific details for each generation. Also, your children and grandchildren will thank you for properly organizing all of this documentation. I cannot tell you how many times members have come into the library to redo research that their grandparents or their parents did. So I will go over specifically, one, how to create a qualification outline, including the correct uh, genealogical formatting. Uh, two, I will go over how to gather and mark and make photocopies of these documents. And three, I'll go over how to provide citations for each of these records. Okay, so first, to organize information, we first recommend creating a qualification outline. A qualification outline is an excellent way to organize information for each generation in your line of descent, especially if you're planning to apply to more than one society. So you should begin with your generation, including vital information for your spouse, if applicable, and state your place and date of birth and the place and date of your marriage, if applicable. When documenting vital, record, vital events, you should indicate the place of the event using the name of the town or city, county, and state, as well as the complete date. And you should use the day, month, and year. 
You should be consistent when recording this place and date information. If, the, if you list the event place first and the date second, or vice versa, you should keep that format throughout the, app, the outline. Uh, be consistent when you're doing this. Additionally, for each statement of vital information, so that birth, marriage, and death information, you should also include a, a scholarly citation. For example, footnote 1 will include a citation for your birth certificate. Footnote 2 will include a citation for your marriage cer certificate. And footnote 3 will be your spouse's birth certificate. Three generations, you, your parents, and your grandparents. These vital statements should be proven by a birth, marriage, and death certificate. If you don't, do not already have access to these records, such as in a file cabinet at home or a safety deposit box, you can typically locate modern, death, uh, modern vital records with the town or the city clerk where the event occurred or the appropriate state vital statistics office. Uh, many societies require birth, marriage, and death certificates for those first three generations. Now, because every society uses their own specific citations and abbreviations, I recommend using evidence, citation and analysis for the family historian, or the newly published Guide to Genealogical Writing by our own Penny Stratton when creating your qualification outline. I would not waste time creating a qualification outline that used the citations for a specific society. Uh, my reason being is that these two books provide detailed citations that can be retrieved again if necessary. Uh, since lineage societies tend to use abbreviated citations, uh, the citations may be uh, confusing later on. So this is especially true if you pl uh, plan to apply to, one, to more than one society. Uh, you may also use more than one footnote to identify a factor location. For example, if you were unable to locate an official birth record for an individual, but you were able to locate them in the 1860, the 1870, the 1880, 1900 census, uh, as well as their death certificate, I would include a footnote for each census record as well as the death certificate. The weight of these combined records may be enough to prove place, of, place and date of birth. So next, on a separate sheet of paper, you should include proof for your parents' generation. That's including information for their birth. Continue this process for each generation, concluding with your qualifying ancestor. Evidence for each name, place, and date is essential to your membership application. Also, you should continue to include citations for each vital statement. For example, footnote 4 should include a citation for your father's birth certificate. Footnote 5 would include a citation for your father's death certificate, and so on and so forth. Remember to include citations as you go. Do not promise yourself that you will go back and complete the citation later. You may forget or you may misplace the record, and if so, lose countless of hours trying to recreate your research. Uh, also, when you're developing your qualifica well, qualification outline, remember to include information for a second marriage, even if the marriage is outside of your bloodline. So here's an example of a generation with more than one marriage. Note that the outline includes the name of the spouse, as well as the information for their birth, marriage, and death. When you compile your qualification outline, it is essential for you to remember that the society genealogists will base their assessment of your ancestral line using the documentation that you provide. Therefore, we first suggest locating all of the possible vital records, so those birth, marriage, and death records, for each generation. Since vital records often provide specific information about an individual, such as the place and date of birth, as well as information about their parents, these records can be used to connect several generations. Keep in mind that each state has very specific procedures when ordering vital records. For example, some states require a copy of an applicant's photo identification, or a self-addressed self stamped envelope, or a signed application. Others only accept a vital record request in writing. Additionally, some states take credit card payments, while others only accept personal checks or money orders. Whatever the condition, be sure to satisfy all of these requirements before submitting an application. 
You don't want to lose money during this process. Um, some states do not allow certified copies of vital records due to privacy restrictions. However, informational or genealogical copies of a vital record can be available for a lesser charge and also don't follow under those strict uh, privacy guidelines. These non-certified copies sometimes provide an alternative when records are available due to privacy restrictions. Most societies will take copies of these informational or genealogical copies. Um, unfortunately, there is no one-stop shop for vital records, as the location, availability, and accessibility of vital records can vary from state to state. Uh, to locate available records in New England, I would suggest looking at the NEHGS uh, Handbook for New England Research. Uh, and for those who are looking for vital records outside of New England, you should look at uh, the source or the Red Book. Once you've located a potential vital record collection, gather all possible records for each generation. Be sure to search for birth, marriage, and death records for the male and female in each generation. Remember that this also includes second marriages. You should use variant spellings when searching for your ancestors. Because spelling in the, 19th and, uh, the 18th and 19th century was not as uniform as it is today, a vital record for your ancestors may have been transcribed incorrectly or spelled differently. Once you've located a vital record, include a clear, legible photocopy of each document. Do not include vital record. Do not include original records or records that cut off information. Uh, these records will be submitted with your final application and are sometimes not returned to you. So if you send your original documentation with your membership application, you may lose that. And that wouldn't be good if it's your original birth record. Uh, you should also underline or draw an arrow in red pen or pencil to identify your ancestor, as I did here with the Adams family. Uh, do not use highlighter or sticky notes. And also, do not use staples if a vital record includes more than one page. If there are any discrepancies on the documentation, such as a spelling variant or an incorrect maiden name, you should include an explanation. This is especially true if an ancestor in your direct bloodline remarries. Even though this new spouse is not part of your bloodline, documentation of birth, marriage, and death for the second spouse will help to clear up any confusion. So, for example, since many modern death records provide the name of the deceased spouse, the second spouse's name may have been recorded on the death certificate, and that would be confusing to the society genealogist. They may not be convinced that the death record refers to your ancestor. So you should include supportive documentation that will help to quell any of this possible confusion. Uh, if the discrepancy on the records is more involved than a simple spelling variant, uh, such as multiple dates of birth or multiple birth locations. Uh, you can address this on a separate sheet of paper. You should state the problem and then include original source evidence to prove that one of those statements is more, uh, more valid than the other. Once you've gathered all the proper documentation, you can then fill out your application. Be sure to read all of the instructions included on the application, as well as the Society's website before you submit your final application. Follow those specifications for scholarly citations, formatting, and organization. Remember to sign your application and include proper payments. Okay, so here is a mock application for the General Society of Mayflower Descendants for our second President, United States, uh, for our second United States President, John Adams. While your uh, Mayflower application may look similar, I want to stress that this is not an, an actual application. Okay, so notice that the first two generations, uh, the John, A John Alden and Ruth Alden, that there's no uh, citations for those. Uh, this is because the General Society of Mayflower Descendants has developed a series of books known as the Mayflower Families Through Five Generations, which is lovingly known as the Silver Books or the Mayflower Families in Progress, which is lovingly known as the Pink Books. 
Uh, these books can be used as proof for the first five generations for the Mayflower Society. And while these books are accepted by Mayflower, other societies may not accept the books as proof. Uh, you should include the full name of your ancestor, which is the first, middle, and last name. The name should be spelled as it originally appeared on the record. If you find a name spelled using variant spellings, you can include both of those spellings. Also, if an ancestor uses a nickname or an alternative name, you may also include this information. You should not use profession, rank, or title when filling out the application. For example, you should write John Adams for Generation 5, not United States President John Adams. Uh, you should provide specific information for each vital event, including the date, which is the day, month, and year, in that order, uh, and the location, town, county, and state. If the name of the town or county changed, you should use the town or county name from that time of the event. For example, the town of Braintree was part of Suffolk County before Norfolk County was established in 1793. Therefore, when completing the birth information for John Adams in Generation 4, you should identify the place as Braintree, Suffolk County, Massachusetts. Also, do not write unknown or NA for a vital event. If a specific date is unknown, you should include a date range or an estimated date. For example, use the term before or after to identify the first or last known record for your ancestor. This is commonly used when a probate record substitutes for a death record. The date of the will is the after date and the date the will is proved is the before date. Also, if an event was recording using double dating, you should include both dates. Now, what do I mean by double dating? Uh, in September of 1752, the British Empire switched from the Julian calendar to the Gregorian calendar, which dropped 11 days from the calendar year. Uh, so, for example, Hannah Bath in Generation 3 uh, she was married in Braintree, Suffolk County, Massachusetts, on 8 February 1687-8. You should include both of those dates. How long is it going to take? So depending on the society, the application process will vary. Some applications are submitted directly to the, gen the Registrar General, while others are approved first by the State Society and then forward on for national approval. So this process, depending on the society, can take anywhere from two weeks to a year. Now, specifically for the uh, Mayflower Society, they have a multi-step process. Uh, first, the society sends the potential member a preliminary application. Now, this worksheet is very basic. It on, uh, only names are required on this application. Upon completion of the preliminary application, the membership secretary of your state society will forward the preliminary application to the state historian. Next, the state historian will check your ancestral line against previously approved applications. So, if other members of your family, including distant relatives, have been members of the Mayflower Society, then it may be unnecessary for you to prove each generation. Once the state historian has determined what documentation is still necessary, you are given a worksheet application. You must then fill out the application, complete with citations and documentation, and return the worksheet to the state historian. Next, the state historian will then review your application, and this process could take several months. Once the state historian has approved your application, you must sign the application and forward it to the general historian, which is in Plymouth. Uh, if the application is rejected, you would then have two years to, to uh, properly document your line. Uh, finally, the general historian in Plymouth uh, will, pr will approve or reject your application. Now, it's uncommon for an applicant to document their line using only vital records. Therefore, researchers must use alternative records or secondary sources to prove the connection between generations. I will discuss a few of the common alternative vital records. 
However, I must stress that these are not these are not the only possible alternative records. You should use your creativity to locate other possible primary source documents if you cannot find them in the records that I'm about to describe. So first are family Bible records, which can be rare but extremely helpful. To locate these records, you should uh, think of a historical society, archive, or a genealogical society that's associated with the family, such as NEHGS. They may have these, uh, these rare Bible records included in their manuscripts collection. Now to locate them, you could, one of the, one of the places that you could check is the free database archive grid. Uh, and this is a search that I did for the John Adams Bible, and you may notice a uh, society that you're familiar with uh, that has a holding for the Adams family. So this actually came up with 80 different uh, entries. So you could search through those to, to find a Bible record that may be particular to your family. Now census records can provide information about an entire family, often individually listing the names of each member of the household. However, before 1850, the U.S. federal census did not enumerate each member. The head of the household was named, and then the other members of the household were designated by tally marks according to their age and general gender. As a result, the pre-1850 U.S. federal census records can be less helpful, and they're often not acceptable. You can find these records at AmericanAncestors.org, uh, FamilySearch.org, Fold3, and Ancestry.com, and they have searchable collections for uh, U.S federal censuses from 1790 to 1940, uh, as well as some state, uh, state census records as well. Uh, generally, lineage societies will accept photographs of tombstones as proof of death and sometimes of marriage, uh, which you can see on the side here, this one, this uh, tombstone for Amy Ballou. She's the wife of John W. Adams and then she died November 7th, 1826. So this would be something that you could potentially use not only as her death record, but also as her marriage record to John Adams. If you're using a tombstone as proof, you should include a clear photo of the stone, as well as a broader landscape photo showing surrounding stones. This will provide the society with context and demonstrate the age of the tombstone. Some societies also require a photograph of the cemetery sign. Societies will not accept modern cemetery stones that were made in memorial to an ancestor. Uh, some places to find these, there's some na uh, national cemetery databases. Uh, find a Grave is a good one, BillionGraves.com, internment.net, and locateagrave.org. Now, like vital records, uh, church records are usually record vital events, but for different reasons. So they'll record baptisms, marriages, confirmations, and burials. And those are not always registered on the local or state level. So to locate a church record, you must first identify your ancestor's religion and or their congregation. Once a denomination is determined, you can then work to locate available records. Some records are still maintained by the original church or in a church archives, while others have been microfilmed or published. Uh, here at the NEHGS library, we maintain a large collection of compiled church records that have been published from across the United States. Uh, and the Family History library, library also has several church records on microfilm. If you're going to include a vital record from a published source, you must include the title page for those published records. This is true uh, in TypeScript, and then also for any record that you may find on microfilm. They'd like to see the title page uh, from that microfilm reel. Uh, land records can sometimes identify specific re relationships between the grantor, who is the seller, and the grantee, who is the purchaser of the property. This can be especially common for married men who sold property, as the record often identifies the first name of the grantor's wife. Uh, most deed records for the United States, I'm sorry, for the New England states are available on microfilm at the NEHGS library, while other U.S. land records are available digitally at FamilySearch.org or they're on microfilm at, uh, at the Family History Library. 
While local histories and genealogies are often unacceptable as singular proof, well-documented or properly cited sources can provide supplemental proof for lineage. Now, what do I mean by singular proof? Uh, some records, such as vital records, can be, found, uh, can be used as the only evidence of a vital event. A birth certificate, for example, would constitute, would constitute a singular proof. Uh, because published genealogies were created by a third party and not at the time of the actual event, they cannot be used as the only evidence. Uh, therefore, you should use published genealogies and histories as supplemental proof. Uh, again, if you use a, um, a published resource, you should also include a photocopy of the title page. Now, you can find several of these resources here at the NEH, NEHTS library. Uh, but if you cannot get here, they're also sometimes available on archive.org or on Google Books. Uh, and the Family History Library has also started to digitize many of its uh, books as well. Uh, probate files, such as wills and guardianship records, can provide researchers with information about the deceased as well as the names of their heirs which is usually their spouse, their children, and sometimes, depending on how uh, late they lived, their grandchildren. Uh, NEHDS maintains a large collection of New England and Atlantic Canada probate on microfilm. Uh, and then you could also find several U.S. town and county probate collections at uh, familysearch.org or at the Family History Library on microfilm. If you're going to be including a probate record with your application, you should include the entire record and not just the relevant pages. Um, our expert for hire staff uh, the research, at the Research Service Department at NEHDS handles an array of lineage-related cases, uh, from locating documentation that connects two generations to completing an entire lineage application, which would include a qualification outline and copies of any supporting documentation. Uh, the staff can provide assistance to any HGS, any HGS members as well as non-members with their lineage paperwork, which is including those nasty brick walls. Uh, for example, Research Services was hired to complete an entire Mayflower application for an NEHGS member who descended from George Sewell. Uh, but, and I consider this to be the most important detail, the majority of the early generations were born, married, and dying in New York State. Since New York State did not keep vital records until 1880, the researcher had to locate alternative vital records to prove the connection between these early generations. To help demonstrate how to use alternative vital records to prove lineage, I extracted three of the earlier generations. That's Generation 6, David Dewey and Mary Cole, Generation 7, Rebecca Dewey and Allenson Jeremiah Green, and Generation 8, Collins Benjamin Green and Mary Jane LaGraves. Okay, so here is a qualification outline for Generation 7, Rebecca Dewey and Allenson Jeremiah Green. Rebecca Dewey was the daughter of David Dewey and Mary Cole, which is that sole bloodline. Notice the length and the specificity of the footnotes for each vital event. Also, see how the researcher used more than one source to prove each vital statement? For example, to prove that Rebecca Dewey Green was born in Washington County, New York, the researcher used her 1898 death record, the 1875 New York State Census, and a published genealogy entitled Descendants of Joseph Green. If you will remember from our discussion earlier, I explained that published genealogies can be used to corroborate vital record information, but not on their own. Here is a good example of that tactic working successfully. In addition to the vital events, so those that birth, marriage, and death, location, and dates, the researcher also had to make a connection between Rebecca Dewey and her parents, who were David Dewey and Mary Cole, as well as to her son, which is Collins Benjamin Green, and his wife, Mary Jane LaGraves. Now, this can sometimes be the most difficult part of documentation. It is important to remember that while birth, marriage, and death information is important to your application, it is the connection between the generations that's the most important. 
After all, this is a lineage society. So to prove the connection between Rebecca Dewey Green and her parents, the researcher relied on the information from the 1898 death record. As you can see, the record indicates that she was the daughter of David Dewey and Polly Cole. Since Polly was a popular nickname for Mary in the 19th century, the death record can be used to show the connection between generation 6 and 7. How, though, was the researcher able to make the connection between Rebecca Dewey Green and her son, Collins Benjamin Green? Here you can see generation 8, which is Collins Benjamin Green and his wife, Mary Jane the Graves. Notice that the researcher provides several citations for each vital event, including the 1892 death record. Maybe, as we saw with the previous generation, the death record will provide the names of Colin Benjamin Green's parents. Okay, so as you can see here, the death record properly indicates that Collins B. Green died on 1 January uh, 1894 at the age of 52. However, the record only indicates the name of his father as Allenson J. Green. His mother's name and birthplace are not indicated. As a result, the researcher needed to locate alternative documentation that would connect these two generations. So to do so, the researcher located the will of Rebecca Green, which was dated 1897, in Jefferson County, New York. Here is a copy of one of the relevant pages. But as you, as you may remember, if you're including a probate record in your application, you should include the entire record, as well as a copy of the title page, not just that relevant page. Okay, so according to her will, Rebecca Green bequeathed some of her personal estate to her heirs, including her daughter-in-law, Mary Green, who received one patent rocker, which is a mechanized rocking chair. She also gave property to her granddaughter, Cora Bresch, who inherited one silver butter dish and one basket bed quilt. Her son, Collins Benjamin Green, was not named in the will because he had died in 1894, three years prior. However, because Rebecca Green identified her granddaughter as Cora Bresch, and we have other documentation that's not shown here, that Cora Green, daughter of Collins Benjamin Green, generation 8, married a man named Peter Bresch. The will proves wonderful, wonderful evidence of the connection between all three of these generations. Yet, Rebecca Green's 1897 will was not the only alternative rec vital record that the researcher used to provide the connection between generation 7, 8, and 9. As you may be able to see from the lengthy footnotes, the researcher was also able to locate photographs of tombstones, census records, probate records, family letters, and a Civil War draft registration card, all of evidence of the connection between Generation 7, 8, and 9. But not only, not only did these documents provide birth, marriage, and death information, but they also proved that connection, which is that most important detail. Now, most importantly, because of the ty tireless efforts of the research services staff, we are proud to say that the NEHGS member was accepted into the Mayflower descendants as a descendant of George Soul. So if you would like help documenting your ancestral line or completing the application process, you can always hire our research services team. You can learn more by going to the webpage AmericanAncestors.org slash research dash services or by contacting research at NEHGS.org. NEHGS members will receive a discounted hourly rate. Uh, and if you missed anything that we went over today, I just completed a portable genealogist about applying to lineage societies, which will be available in October. It provides a neat, organized approach to the subject, as well as some tips and reminders for the application process.
All right, thank you, Lindsay, for your presentation. So now let's tackle your questions. If you have anything you'd like to ask Lindsay, please type it in the questions panel, and Lindsay will try to answer as many as she can in the time provided. All right, so we have a number of questions, Lindsay. Um, the first one comes from Catherine, who asks, um, are digital images found uh, through online databases such as, you know, AmericanAncestors.org or Ancestry or Family Search? Are those enough, or does she need to actually order a certificate from the holder of that record? Um, well, if if it's an actual if, like the original image uh, of the certificate, then that would be fine. That that's most of the societies will be fine with that as proof. Um, the problem will be is if you if you locate something either on our website or Family Search or uh, Ancestry that's like an index, so it gives you all of the information that's on the record, but it's not the physical record. Usually, they want to have the original record in the, in that case, so y you would need to order that. But if it's if it's in you know in TypeScript or if it was if it's handwritten, then uh, they'll accept those as as what they consider original documentation. Okay, and we have a question from Beth. She says, uh, my Revolutionary War ancestors are on my mother's side. A DAR member told me that I need to provide documentation on my father's side for the first three generations. Is that correct? Yes. <laughs> um, for, for all of those generations going back to the, uh, to the Patriot ancestor, you're going to need to include, well, for the first three generations, you're going to need birth, marriage, and death information and certificates for you, your parent, and your grandparent for birth, marriage, and death. Uh, everything after that, they like to have documentation for all three of those vital events. Um, they like to have information for all three of those vital events. Uh, but if you only have uh, one or two re uh, original sources for that, I believe that uh, DAR is fine with that. Um, but you're going to need to provide, because you're going to need to fill out that application, so you're going to have to provide as much information as possible. So it's always good. I always say that it's it's better to provide them with more information than less. Um, so it would be better if you got you know birth, marriage, and death information for everybody in that line, both the male and the female line. Okay, and this is a question that um, you know we we heard a lot about when we were preparing for this webinar. We got a few emails about this, and there are a few questions about it in the uh, questions panel as well. But um, is the process any different when the person applying is adopted? Well, because it's a lineage society, uh, you're going to need to apply through your biological parents. So you wouldn't be able to apply under your adopted parents' uh, lineage. Now, that being said, if, you, if your biological parents were descendants from, you know, a passenger on the Mayflower or, a, you know, whatever qualifying ancestor, uh, you would just need to provide information that, that, that those were your original biological parents. Uh, so that would be uh, your adoption paperwork, if that's available, and then any information about uh, your biological parents, their birth, marriage, and death records uh, as well. But I would include, um, I'm depending on, I mean, I would definitely make it known in your application that you were adopted in case there's any uh, you know, confusion looking at the documentation that, you know, what line they're following. Uh, so I would try to include information on that as well. Thanks. And we have a few questions about uh, newspapers. So newspaper obituaries, marriage announcements, birth announcements found in the newspaper. Um, are those also kind of vital record alternatives that you can use? And is there anything that they should know when preparing those documents? Uh, yes, those are also those are considered alternative uh, vital records as well. Uh, if you find an obituary or a marriage announcement, birth announcement in a paper, you should include. I like to include two two sets of um, two sets of the of the original record. First, a uh, close up of the actual like a clipping that is very legible because uh, sometimes those older newspapers are a little bit harder to read. Uh, so a, a close up clipping of of what of what the what you want that uh, society genealogist to be looking at. 
and then I take a photocopy of the entire newspaper page. That way they can tell what page it came from. Usually the date is, because when you're taking a clipping, you're cutting out the, the date that it's occurring, so the date will be included on there, the name of the newspaper. Uh, I like to include that full sheet and then, and then the, the closer copy. Okay, and a question from Hope who asks, uh, when documenting wives, do you only include their maiden name or their married name as well? Um, I think I understand. Well, it, it, you should always include the maiden name of, so whatever that person's name was at birth is the name that you should pr be providing on the qualification outline. Um, so, for example, if, if Mary Smith was born Mary Smith, that would be the initial name. Now, if Mary Smith got named to a gentleman named Jones and then Donnell, you would include all three of those names, even though she would initially be known as Mary Smith. Uh, and then you would include documentation for those other marriages as well. If, I hope that answers your question. Okay, and we have a number of questions regarding, um, you know, already uh, processed applications, you know, either, you know, through the DAR or Mayflower Society or what have you. Um, is there a way to look at previously submitted applications? Um, can you maybe just say a few words about using those successful applications, whether that's um, if if that's allowed or uh, what the access levels are um, and, and that sort of thing. Well, I feel like as everything I've said today, it depends on the society. Um, so Mayflower has a, uh, they have a database of already approved applications and lineages. You cannot see that. That's something that they check um, on their own. Um, so some, I mean, you can, there's, yeah, you wouldn't really be able to see that. Say, now, DAR has a database that you can search for a Patriot ancestor to see if that's already been proven. Now, if you are able to find someone on there, it gives the, that next generation, so whoever that Patriot's an ancestor's children are would be included on there. Anything after that, uh, would not be, a, you wouldn't be able to look at it. it. You'd have to purchase what they call a record copy, uh, which would give you more information about everyone else in that line. Um, now, that being said, they don't always accept those older applications. Um, it needs to be more modern applications that they that you can use. I mean, you can just kind of piggyback, uh, you know, on on some of the newer applications. But the older stuff, you know, from the from the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, um, they don't accept that as readily uh, as something that was, you know, uh, that was approved 10 years ago. Uh, so I'd be careful with that as well. Um, I know Colonial Dames has a, a database that you can check. Usually these databases are for the qualifying ancestor, not necessarily that line going back. Um, so you can usually check to see if someone has, has applied under that ancestor, but not necessarily the entire lineage. Okay, and we are almost out of time. I will just ask a few more questions before uh, ending for the day. Um, so here's a question. How do you deal with a name change? Um, for example, this is, this is a question from Beth who asks, you know, uh, a name change from, say, David Elcock to David Elcott. Um, how do you uh, mark that or record that in your application process? Well, for a name that changes that slightly, I would just include that as, as a, it's almost like it's a variant spelling on that name. Um, you know, so Smith with with an I or a Y would, you know, that would have just been a variant spelling. So I would just include both names. So the include the way that you're seeing it first, so that, that first um, spelling that you find, and then just a uh, slash, and then the next way that you're seeing it 
uh, written. That would be acceptable if if the surname is you know close enough. You know, if if it would be found under the same Soundex code, then I wouldn't really worry about it. Um, if someone dramatically changed their name, so say that say that someone in your line married into uh, married like an immigrant ancestor from the 20th century and they had um, they had their name they, they changed their name once once you know they Americanized their name once they came um, that in that case you may have to provide proof of that name change now that could either be done using a court document or a naturalization record um, but I would because again because you're providing birth marriage and death information for this person if they're being born under one name and dying under another you need to provide some sort of explanation for that uh, and if the name changes that reason then then I would provide that information as well okay and just a few more questions before we end um, so you mentioned of course, uh, documenting second marriages, and we have a few questions about this, but um, the assumption is that third, fourth, fifth marriages should also be documented. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know that's a lot of work, but um, it, the reason being is that you don't, it, you don't know what kind of documentation you're going to be providing that, that uh, society genealogist. So say, for example, someone gets married four or five times and you're providing, uh, a, you know, a, a couple land records, for example, and this person is married and that wife's name keeps changing, um, you're going to have to have an explanation of that. Uh, if the death record has, um, you know, like the, the, the fifth wife's name on it, you're going to have to, again, provide an explanation of that. So I know that it sounds like a lot of work, but, I, but most societies want... They, they want all of that information included. Great. So, um, sorry, I'm going to have, have to wrap up, but um, once again, if you'd like hands-on help with your Lineage Society application or have more de detailed questions about the specifics of your research, uh, you may want to consider schedule, scheduling a consultation with Lindsay or uh, one of our other experts, um, and you can actually schedule a consultation for over the phone or in person. So you don't necessarily have to live in Boston for that consultation. Um, you could also hire our research services team. Um, so if you're interested in learning more about those services, you can write to the email addresses on the current slide, and I'll also include this information in my follow-up email to you tomorrow. Thank you again for joining us today. As you leave the event, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey and give us your feedback. As we continue to expand our webinars and online offerings, any and all feedback is extremely helpful and appreciated. So be sure to explore our website, AmericanAncestors.org, which offers access to millions of records covering New England, New York, and beyond. And if you're ever in the Boston area, feel free to stop by our research library and archives. We're open to the public and hold a vast collection of published genealogies, biographies, local histories, microfilms, manuscripts, and more. If you'd like to access more how-to resources or learn about upcoming online educational programs, please visit our online learning center, AmericanAncestors.org slash learning hyphen center. I hope to see you at our online programs in the future. Goodbye for now.